Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe with Streamline Capital. Really excited for today's show. We've got Mark Curry on the line with us today. And that said, Mark, how are you doing today? Doing well, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. And uh, I'm excited to jump in and, and hear a little bit about what you're doing. You've been in this space for quite a while. So let's talk about before. You know, what, Give us an idea of your background and your history and you know, tell us a little tale, weave us a story of how you got into apartment investing. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Background history. So I, I um, went to school for finance. I worked in corporate America after school for a number of years, a lot of spreadsheets, I was doing budgets and planning, internal auditing. And, you know, I kind of got this, this real estate investing bug while working in corporate America. This is in 2004-ish, um, mm -hmm. bought my first place. Um, it was a a little story for you, as you asked. Mm -hmm. There's a, a probate I bought at the courthouse steps. It uh, didn't have a clue what I was doing and uh, got real lucky, I guess, right? This was one of yeah. those auctions where as long as you had the check in hand, you could <laughs> overbid. And there, I, I thought I'd already was the winning bidder. And sure enough, the judge said, hey, is there any other bidders that want to go higher? And there was two other guys in the room that both <laughs> raised their hand with checks in their hand. And I looked over at my agent who was helping me like, what's going on? I thought this was mm -hmm. art. Apparently he didn't know what he was doing either. And so, oh, geez. Whoops. <laughs> but uh, one of them had the check made out incorrectly. So the judge wouldn't accept it. And so I got lucky. I got that place at a discount um, mm -hmm. and I was hooked for life, I guess you could say. And so that nice. was 20 years ago. And uh, since then, I, you know, I worked for corporate America for a number of years further past that first acquisition, but mm -hmm. Prior to leaving corporate America, I was partnering with my brothers, my parents, uh, my aunts mm -hmm. and uncles, just family. We were buying stuff, pennies on the dollar at the time, Brian, you know, yeah. recession, 2008, 9, 10. Mm -hmm. you know, we, I wish we had bought everything and anything we could get our hands on. But uh, yes. we built a small portfolio and then by 2010, um, left corporate America and went full time into real estate investing. Wow, that was pretty quick. So. Man, buying at a discount. I I hope that's where we're at right now. I mean, it's hard to tell the future, but uh, sure. you know, prices have declined. I, I I hope that's what we're saying. You know, five or eight years from now is, man, I wish I would have bought a lot more. But when I mean, you guys did did well, you you looked at the opportunity market had crashed, and you were buying things pennies on the dollar. So anyway, let's let's talk transition a little bit there. You know, what was going through your mind? You know, leaving corporate America, jumping into, you know, this real estate investing thing. I um, had a passion for it. That was number mm -hmm. one. I loved it, right? And we were very yeah. hands-on at the time, Brian. I would say as active as an investor you could be. Mm -hmm. We were buying a lot of fix and flips, boarded up houses, properties, 12 yep. units or less was typically our sweet spot in a couple of different markets. And I just have this innate attention to detail, which is mm -hmm. just mandatory, I think, to be successful when uh, turning around properties. And so- yep. I think that helped in our success is very much a labor of love and attention and detail. Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. I wanted to do more of it. I also, since I would say even high school, I'd always wanted to run my own company, be an entrepreneur, have my own business. And so we, I saw an opportunity to do that right. at that time. So that was a big part of the transition, of course, just to keep going and do more with what we already had kind of been doing on the side. Yeah. Nice. Nice. What would you say was the biggest challenge you had on that first transition? Gosh, I'd say at the time it was the market for sure. 2009 and 10, the world was crashing around us from an economic standpoint. And there was so much uncertainty out there. You didn't have a clue if you were overpaying or underpaying for a deal a lot of times. And raising capital from investors was extremely hard. Finding financing for acquisitions was non-existent in certain areas and markets and asset classes. And yep. so talk about starting at a really tough time. I mean, that's how we got our beginnings and worked our way through it. And so we yep. focused on assets that we could get our hands on that made sense regardless of kind of what the market was doing. And that was all heavy value add, right? We're going to yeah. create a lot of appreciation here. Maybe comparing apples and oranges because you said you were in the, the, the below 12 units. But do you see parallels right now to you know 2009, 2010 timeframe? There's some for sure. It mm -hmm. is different for sure as well, Brian. I think if mm -hmm. you want me to compare and contrast, I would say, yeah. obviously, there's financing challenges today. The cost yep. of debt has skyrocketed in the fastest pace of interest rate hikes not seen in 40 years. Mm -hmm. That has put a big dampen on transactional volume and has put a big gap between buyer and seller 
pricing. There's yep. you know, 20, 30% discrepancy between what a seller wants and a buyer wants to, to pay on many deals, but not all. We're still able to actually find some pretty attractive yep. things today. And then looking back in 2009, 2010, and we've seen it, by the way, we've seen a little bit of a softening, of course, in mm -hmm. demand, depending yep. on asset class and location, but yeah. not quite like we saw in the recession. We had mm -hmm. a larger softening in demand. We had a, a basically the financial markets stopped lending. Yeah. And so it was a, a lot more exacerbated than what we're seeing today. And I, I would say a lot more volatility and devastating because you also mm -hmm. saw demand go down as well from residents, from customers. We had to drop rents, I remember, in 2009 mm -hmm. by 15, 20% on some properties. Ooh, ouch. We've had some softening on rents, but we haven't had a lot of properties see rents go down, sure. you know, and a couple of times we've had to not raise rents or, you know, put the renewals right where they're at. But it's actually a little bit encouraging to hear that it was worse, you know, 15 years ago. I had bought my first single family home in 2007 and, you know, wasn't really deep into it at the time. So I, I didn't get the uh, the full exposure. But anyway. Yeah. Oddly, oddly, I, I find that comforting that it was a lot worse 15 years ago. But uh, it, it was, it was, Brian. There's a lot of positive in today's market. You don't read about it in the headlines. But oh, no. There. Yep. No, 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 no. So, so you say you you're doing that into the 2010. You you went full time. How did things progress from there? Yeah. So we continued to acquire. You know, I would say deeply discounted, distressed real estate, mm -hmm. predominantly single family, small multifamily. With partners, we brought in outside capital, uh, friends, coworkers, mm -hmm. folks that trusted us already and knew us. We started raising capital, building our investor network, and growing the the business, you know, full time. Right. So we did that from 2010 to 2017. Brian, we were operating partner or sponsor, making all decisions, handling all management internally, down to the paint color on the wall, to you know, doing distributions to investors. Yeah. So we built a portfolio of roughly 60 properties or so across multiple yeah. states that we were managing. It gave us a lot of experience in asset management mm -hmm. going back even to 2005. But uh, yeah. at the same time, again, I had left corporate America. I had a 401k sitting idle and mm -hmm. those dollars, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable or, or knowledgeable enough to put them in the stock market at the time. So I started, uh, opened up a self-directed IRA. I moved the funds over to that and I started... Mm -hmm for a place to invest personally my own retirement dollars yeah. outside of our own deals, right? You can't mm -hmm. put your own retirement dollars in your own deals, prohibited transaction. Yep. I just started networking, Brian. Every mm -hmm. week, uh, every other week, I was in a live group somewhere in Southern California at the time where I was living, mm -hmm. listening to experts speak on different asset classes, different sectors, different strategies, economics, you name it. And mm -hmm. I just a sponge for information also looking for a, a place to invest as an LP, limited yeah. partner. So yeah, we yeah. started investing in mobile home parks, started investing in self-storage, mm -hmm. some larger institutional quality multifamily, looking for assets and sectors within real estate that I could say, look, they actually had done quite well, all things considered, during 2008 yeah. and nine. There wasn't a lot, but those were the first few. To summarize, from 2010 and 2017, we're a sponsor and operator doing our own deals, mm -hmm. but also investing in other deals as an LP. We had made, myself and my family, over 20 separate investments as LPs into mm -hmm. different asset classes in real estate with sponsors nice. and operators. And so after five years of doing both full time, mm -hmm. seven years, whatever it ended up being, we had a pretty darn good data set. You could say, yeah. look how well this group's doing in the mobile home park space and compare and contrast risk and return and decided at, at that point to, to pivot again. And this mm -hmm. next pivot was to stop being a sponsor and operator mm -hmm. and to focus strictly on diversification mm -hmm. and raising capital with sponsors that we had built relationships with in different asset classes and different regions, really reducing risk, right? We mm -hmm. had that mindset for quite some time and, there was a lot of indicators in 2018, 19, that there could be a recession coming soon. And so we wanted to position ourselves for that and started really investing yeah. full-time as a private equity firm. And that's still what we do today. Yeah. Interesting. So I want to dive a little bit deeper in that one. So you went from lead sponsor to, 
you know, raising money for other people, diversification. You know, walk us through that one a little bit more. You know, obviously there's there's pros to each side, but you go a little bit deeper into that thought process, why you liked one over the other one. Yeah. So a couple things, both great strategies, right? Well, you got to find out what's best for you. Mm-hmm. Where do you think you excel? I think we do pretty darn good at the asset classes that we're sponsor mm-hmm. and operator in, but the margins keep getting squeezed on single mm-hmm. family, small multifamily, fix and flips yep. are harder to find. The market has evolved and we saw mm-hmm. that for many years, Brian, right? It yep. was a matter of time. Mm-hmm. So part of the pivot was due to wanting to continue to access better investments with great returns. The other part of the pivot was really focused on reducing risk. Historically, single family has been highly correlated to the overall economy and market. Mm-hmm. So the valuations of homes can go down during a downturn. Yeah. And so again, we thought there was a potential downturn coming and we'll see if and when that continues to happen. It's been up and down for a number of years, but yep. we wanted to position ourselves with that in mind. And so that was a big part of it too. It's more of a longer term thesis of where do we think mm-hmm. the best risk adjusted returns can be achieved and do mm-hmm. we have the ability to, to make that pivot? And so yeah. we, we leaned on the relationships that we had built by investing personally mm-hmm. first and those sponsors, and then we, we raised capital with them to start. And so it, the transition was a bit slow. We were cautious to give up some mm-hmm. control because that's really what we're doing. But we did on purpose to achieve what we think is a better, again, risk-adjusted return. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you do it right, you know, you're giving up control to the right people and they're better at it than you are. It makes perfect sense, you know? Everybody's got their strengths and mine may be operating while yours is capital raising or vice versa. So I think operating in your strengths is wise to be able to make that decision. And, you know, a lot of times I look at, you know, me wanting to be in control and I wonder, you know, is that where I, my strength is or is that more ego? But sure. anyway, yeah, giving giving that that control up can be a little scary, but, you know, it looks like it's worked well for you so far. Yeah, we prefer it at this point, Brian. Again, we invest in about seven or eight different asset classes. Mm -hmm. And so our investors get access to things that they otherwise wouldn't get from us if we Mm -hmm. were just doing one thing. And so that's one of the benefits too for what we see is our our investors will invest and they can create a diversified portfolio for themselves by spreading out their capital to different deals. Nice, nice. Well, let's uh, let's actually talk about those then, Mark. Uh, what other asset types are you investing in, and you know why do you like them? Yeah, so not a lot has changed. I'll say, mm-hmm. Brian. We, again, we've tried a lot, and where we focus today are mobile home parks, mm-hmm. self storage, apartments, and I'll be specific: some apartments, not all, and especially in today's market. Yep. We love triple net industrial. We also do invest in private real estate debt funds. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to kind of get an idea of what type of investor would go into, say, an, a debt fund or an ATM fund or something like that compared to multifamily. Yeah. I mean, we, one way to look at things is mm-hmm. some of the investments like ATMs and private real estate debt are typically mm-hmm. we consider to be fixed income. There's no growth. And so you need to know that up front. You need mm-hmm. to know the purpose of why you're investing in something that provides just income and no growth and mm-hmm. be comfortable with it. Now we think it has a great position when inside of a portfolio. Yeah. We we create special funds, Brian, too, where mm-hmm. we'll combine multiple asset classes together. That way our investors can get fixed income and growth and mm-hmm. diversification across yeah. asset classes. Now, with that, if you look at, I'll give you some some comparisons mm-hmm. that I like to see and why we choose to invest in these asset classes. Multifamily, you know, is is one of our staple asset classes. Mm-hmm. We love. There's a lot of pros and there's also some cons, just like yeah. every other asset class. Mm-hmm. When we compare it to, let's say, mobile home parks, there is typically you see less opportunity to increase value through forced depreciation or renovations. Mm -hmm. in multifamily versus mobile home communities. Mm -hmm. A lot of times with mobile home communities, there's just a lot more meat on the bone, Brian, than there would be in multifamily. Mm -hmm. For example, if you invest in a mobile home community that's 70% occupied, uh, let's just break it down. If you have 100 lots, 30 of them are empty, Mm -hmm. you can increase occupancy to 100% by bringing in homes to the community Mm -hmm. and selling or renting them. To compare that in multifamily, you'd have to essentially build more units. Mm-hmm. 
And so it's a lot easier to grow an NOI on a multi, uh, excuse me, mo mobile home community. If you know what you're doing, I shouldn't say it's easier, yep. but there's more uh, upside potential, growth potential by uh, occupancy growth there versus, you know, having to go build uh -huh. family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like what you say. I mean, it's something I, I've been in multifamily for a long time and, you know, when you look at cash flow, does multifamily cash flow? Yes, but you know, if you're really looking for cash flow, and I tell people this a lot, if you're really looking for cash flow and you look for income, multifamily is probably not the best place for you. You know, so I like how you put that. You know, you have your ATM and your debt funds that provide income. You know, multifamily and you know mobile home parks and a couple other asset classes can provide income, but have more uh, appreciation attached to it as well. So. And so you also mentioned you have funds that put a bunch of things together. How do you structure that and how do you decide what goes in? Yeah. Yep. So we'll do, we typically try and create a fund once a year. And okay. what that means for us, normally we'll create a fund, Brian, when we have two or three investments that we want to invest into right around the same time mm -hmm. and that we think complement each other well. And so where one has a little more risk, the other one will have a little bit more downside protection to help offset the risk. And so we will often, if we're able to source enough deals, we'll create a fund. It's usually a you know an LLC that our investors mm -hmm. will fund into. And then the fund will make investments across different sponsors, different okay. asset classes for the period of you know six to 12 months. We're usually doing that. And mm -hmm. then we'll close the fund yeah. to new capital. What question does that bring for you? Because I could talk about it for a while. <laughs> Is each one just a little, little bit different or are you looking for kind of like that blend of the cash flow versus the appreciation versus, you know, security? Yeah, it's the latter. They're, mm -hmm. We're always trying to find a blend. Our investment criteria includes our investors earning between three and 7% cash flow year one and then growing. We want the average cash on cash net to our folks to be, you know, seven to 12% while we hold. Mm -hmm. And then we like to have, you know, an ROI or an IRR of, around 15% plus uh, net to our investors when the investments close. And so trying to find opportunities where we think there's something special mm -hmm. and not all the underwriting assumptions have to actually line up in a deal for you to hit those numbers. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge, right? That's yeah. where you can, you know, you could take a pro forma and adjust the assumptions in five minutes, make the returns look much nicer. Yeah. So we watch out for that. We're not looking for overly rosy projections. We're trying to find sponsors and deals that we work with that have a very high likelihood of meeting or beating the projected returns. And then further, when you combine them together, you know, into a multi-asset fund, multi-sponsor fund, you're reducing your risk pretty significantly if mm -hmm. done correctly. If done properly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the risk reduction, I mean, since they're different asset types. I mean, right now we're seeing, you know, office space sell on pennies on the dollar of what it did, you know, a couple of years ago, but other asset classes are doing extremely well. Industrial, you know, is doing extremely well. So, you know, if you're mixing and matching, you know, debt funds right now, I know a lot of people that are investing in debt funds, so I assume they're doing pretty well. But, you know, you, if you have a couple of different asset types, they're not all going to peak at the same time and they're not all going to bottom out at the same time. And then with different return profiles, you, you can stack them all together so that, you know, you, you got that benefit of a little bit of cash flow up front and a little bit of pop at the end. So, yeah, yeah I like that. Good summary, Brian. And I'll mention yeah. one more thing. As you know, um, you and I spoke a little bit before we started talking here, but the market is tough right now. It's hard to find great deals. And so we found a, the fund model. Um, again, we've been doing this for many years, but in the past 12 months or so, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of investments and we made seven, right? And so yeah. the fund invested in all seven over 12 months. And that way our investors get access to one pool of uh, investment vehicle that has the best seven that we could find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, do you find the type of investor to be different that invests in a fund versus, you know, somebody that would invest in a single syndicated deal? It's a great question. So we have, we do both, by the way, we do mm -hmm. funds and then we'll also do a single syndicated deal when it makes sense to do so. Mm -hmm. And we have investors that invest in both. Mm -hmm. and so are there some folks that will say, nope, I don't do funds. I just do, sure. That's 100%. Yeah. There's folks out there that think that way. And I get it. There's nothing wrong with that. They want to do more due diligence. They want to have the ability to invest in a single asset deal, or maybe it has the potential to have a lot more upside. 
Mm -hmm. You can't recognize the upside potential as much if it's in a fund because it's only a percent True. total. There's also more risk on a single asset deal. So hopefully you're being compensated for a little higher return on that. But yeah, you know, comparing and contrasting the two, like absolutely, there's some folks that just want one or the other. And there's also a lot of people that do both. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've talked with a lot of investors and I think it depends on their portfolio, their investments strategy, what they're what they're looking to get. What's really nice is when you get those investors that uh, are investing on both sides of the fence, the single syndications and your funds, you know, so. Well, cool. Where did we leave off before I went down that last <laughs> rabbit hole? I don't even yeah, I think it was just the pivot to the private equity model and, and right, raising right. capital and creating funds and single asset deals and you know the diversification across asset classes. Take us from there. After is that what you've been doing since that last pivot? Yeah, yeah. It's been seven, eight years now. That's all we focus on, Brian. Uh, we continue to do that. We're going to continue to do that. I appreciate it more. I would say. Um, mm -hmm. As you get older, you, you know, there's less, I would say, management of contractors that we have mm -hmm. to deal with uh, personally. And so obviously our operating partners do that, which is critical to success of a deal. But yeah, I've got two kids and a family. And so the less I have to do with that, the better, right? That's my personal preference at this point in my career. So we're going to keep doing that. We also mm -hmm. continue to see, you know, we're hitting returns and targets on a lot of our deals. And so to go out and try and source something unique and different and operate ourselves, we mm -hmm. would entertain it. But I mean, we'd probably want to see another crash like 2008 and nine before we do something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I hope this crash doesn't get as deep as 2008 and nine. I hope we're so close to that bottom that, uh, you know, we, we can touch it from here. And uh, but yeah, I mean, if we do, you know, there's lot, lots of stuff going from here. All right. So getting into our last round of questions, what's next for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just closing our recent fund, Brian. Uh, mm -hmm. We're almost in the middle of 2024. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of uncertainty as to where the market's going. I will add that it feels as though the bottom has already passed. We've okay. seen 20 to 30% off peak pricing already. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see, I would say in the last couple of months, a lot more transactions happening. Mm -hmm. Cost of borrowing is still very high. And so we're yeah. yet to see if and when the Fed will pivot and start cutting rates, but the psychology is already starting to shift a bit. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing. It allows for a little bit more price discovery. It allows for more transactions to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where things are going, I don't know, but internally we're most yeah. likely going to create another fund soon. We have a few investments right now that we want to invest into uh, in the next quarter. And so that's top of mind. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at, you know, individual deals regularly. There's been a few that have came close lately, Brian, but just mm -hmm. we didn't get over the line on our due diligence. But yeah. there's one top of mind as we're chatting right now that mm -hmm. it's multifamily in Texas that uh, probably going to be flying out there pretty shortly to walk the property in the comps, but mm -hmm. uh, keep going, right? Just keep doing yeah. what's been working, uh, but doing it in a very cautious approach and yeah. patience, right? Very patient. We say no a lot and invest just a few times a year, really. Yeah, I like that. I think that's that's really the answer is say no a lot. And I, but what I found, the more you say no, the easier it is to realize when you should say yes. I like that. Yeah, I, I had to put that on, on a board and hang it on my wall. Yeah. That, was, that was good. Bumper that was good. sticker or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every every once in a while, once every every year or so, I come up with a quote that uh, that I need to keep, and that's probably one of them. But uh, next question for you. You know, speaking to someone who is just starting out in multifamily, you know, maybe they got a full-time job and they're looking at, you know, potentially jumping in. What advice would you give to that person? Yeah, I would say first thing you want to think about is active versus passive. How involved can you and do you want to be? If you want to have control, run the ship, you probably don't want to be working full-time because yeah. it's going to be really hard. If you're taking an active role in managing, financing, raising the capital, doing all the things, have at it. But start out, of course, with those people that trust, know, and like you. If you don't have a track record and you can partner with a group that does have a track record, that is a really big step forward in growth versus starting from the ground up, especially in today's marketplace. Trust, experience, integrity, pedigree yeah. are all critical to success. Yeah, it's, it's quite hard for younger sponsors today to start out on their own, ground floor up. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but just be ready for 
a lot of hurdles to go through to get your first few deals done. Because again, there's the psychology is getting better, but there's a lot of investors sitting on the sidelines right now and that are concerned. Yeah. And I mean, when when market was good, it took me, I think, two and a half, three years to to get to where I could feed my family to where I, where I had enough income for multifamily. That's when the market was good. I think right now that might be extended a little bit because it, it is harder to get into that first deal. So great thoughts. Great thoughts there. And last question, how can listeners learn more about you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the first step I would say is go to our website, which is mm-hmm smkcap.com mm-hmm. Our company name again is smk capital management mm-hmm. we have a lot of information on there brian um, mm-hmm. people can also sign up to receive market updates our investment offerings um, mm-hmm. and you can email me directly with any questions at info at smkcap.com awesome all right we'll make sure that information hits the show notes and just out of curiosity what does smk stand for uh it's my father and i's initials so we started okay. our company together yeah I, I did. I did notice MK was your initials, and that sure. that's up front. Wasn't one hundred percent sure, but well, thanks for coming on the show today. Very much appreciate your time, and that's a wrap today. Okay, thanks for having me, Brian.